Welcome, everyone, to Speak the Truth. My name is Gary Johnson. I'm the publisher and the founder of BlackMenInAmerica.com. I'm going to introduce your host with the mostest every Sunday. He is the National Association of Black Journalists 2020 Pioneer Award winner. He's a walking legend in D.C. and sports talk radio 24-7, 365. I turn it over to Harold Bell. All right. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Harold Bell, and this is Speak the Truth, so it must be Sunday, and Easter Sunday at that. I'd like to thank everyone for taking time out of his this special Sunday to be with us. Let me introduce Speak the Truth team. Gary Johnson wears many hats. He is the founder and CEO of BlackMenInAmerica.com. Out of 500 Black websites on the internet, BlackMenInAmerica.com can be found in the top 10. He has a law enforcement background. His new hat, Master Chef, Gary's Organic Seasoning. My, my wife, Hattie, swears by it, okay? Our next guy, our team member is Chris Johnson, a.k.a. CJ. He's our in-house youth voice. He is all things political and all things sports. He is also a talented musician and the leader of his own band, The Portland Experiments and a contributor to Black Men in America. Let's see who else is here. My, one of my favorite people been with me for decades, and I talk about Miss Maggie Linton. Maggie is a pioneer uh, media personality from Kansas. Uh, she's a grad of Kansas University. She has uh, the state, she was the state's first Black female sportscaster. Those credentials brought her to Washington, D.C., and she became the first Black female sportscaster for WTTG Television 5. She has been an actress on stage and screen, and she was a former producer and host of the Maggie Linton Show, heard on Sirius XM Radio. She is soon to be host and producer of her own podcast. Gary, can we hit the video? Thank you. Yes, sir. Let's go to the video. All right, let's see here. You know, there would have to, uh, let's see. One second here. This is, okay, here we go. Docket number 411275 VR-5, United States versus Lance Corporal Harold W. Dawson and Private First Class Loudon Downey. The accused are charged with murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and conduct on becoming a United States Marine. Does defense wish to enter a plea? Yeah. They're not guilty. Enter a plea of not guilty for the accused. We will adjourn until 10 hundred, three weeks from today, at which time this general court martial will reconvene. Okay, okay. I'd like to introduce uh, our special guest uh, today. He is a proud native Washingtonian, now living in LA, California. He was a DC high school track and field star at Armstrong High School, <clears throat> the home of legends <clears throat> in every walk of life in Black America. He helped lead his high school track team to victory 
in the pin relays in 1949, 50, and 51 in the scholastic division. He ran in the 800 meters and 200 meters. He continued his education in track and field exploits at HBCU North Carolina Central College in Durham, North Carolina. His mentor <clears throat> was the late legendary track and field coach, Dr. Leroy Walker. Coach Walker later became the first black coach of the U.S. Olympic track team and the first black president of the United States Olympic track committee. His acting credits on stage and screen read like a who's who of black actors and actresses in Hollywood. His roles include a court martial judge, a Colonel J.A. Randolph, a United States Air Force Major General, a mayor in Cleveland, he was Leo Daltrey and one of the longest running soap operas in television history, Dallas. He was Richard Matthews in Santa Barbara. Those on screen appearance include a few good men, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> of Air Force One, uh, Body Heat, the TV series Hill Street Blues, and dozens of other soap operas and sitcoms seen across television screens in America. On top of all of that, he was one of the first black air traffic controllers in America before heading to Broadway and later on to Hollywood. I would like to welcome back home virtually. It ain't what it used to be, but it's still home. Welcome Jay A. Preston. How you doing, Jay? I'm good. I'm good. You're good. You're good. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, you're here. Right. How about that? Jay, I, I want to get this thing you know, kick it. I want to know, how did a brother like you get from Armstrong High School in the U Street corridor northwest to Hollywood? Take us through that. <laughs> well, it seems like a natural progression to me. I mean, from U Street to Hollywood. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, <right. form. laughs> yeah. No, I, um, I was an air traffic controller for, uh, 10 years and um, I think really when, when uh, the Kennedys came to Washington, they started uh, small theater groups and Washington kind of, it kind of uh, caught on. However, there was no black theater going on at the time. And uh, I ran into uh, an old track hero of mine, Roscoe Lee Brown. He was performing at the Washington Theater Club. And I went to see a, a production and I saw something I'd never seen before. I mean, he, he was an extremely articulate man. He held, he held command over the audience and um, his movement was impeccable, that of an athlete. Um, it was the kind of performance I'd never, <coughs> excuse me, seen from a black performer in movies before. There wasn't much theater to see in DC. So <clears throat> I hadn't seen any really. And um, Roscoe and I uh, began to talk. Uh, Max Julian, who I grew up with in DC, had told Roscoe if he came to DC to, to look me up. And uh, I met, um, a lady through him who was a, uh, an acting coach. She told me to come to her class. And I said, why? why you? She said, no, you belong on stage. Well, one day when I had nothing to do, I went to her class, I watched it. She said, you can't do that. You got to participate. Um, and I fell in love. I just wanted to do that. Um, um, and I started working with companies that came from uh, New York. They had uh, roles open that they didn't want to pay for. Uh, so they could get me because I wanted to do the roles and I had a day job, but, uh, um, uh, well, 24 seven, but uh, you could always swap with someone. And um, as it went on, um, I started getting reviews and, the government knew what I was doing with my sick leave and annual leave. And they said, hey, look, you know, you got a career here. You got to make up your mind what you want to do. 
So I took off uh, and said, I'll, you know, uh, I'll let you know. And I never came back. Um, I went to New York, hit the ground running, started with the New York Shakespeare Festival. And um, that's the way that went. Mm -hmm. So Jay, one of the things I want to bring people up to date, you mentioned two names in there. <clears throat> and one of those names was uh, Max Julian. Uh, a lot of folks don't have, don't have a clue to who Max Julian was, but Max Julian was an outstanding basketball player out of Washington, D.C., and he played with Elgin Bell at Phelps Vocational High School. Max was a flashy guard there, and of course, Elgin left uh, Phelps and went to Spangarn, and Max Julian went to Howard and ended up, the next thing we knew, like uh, 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 Jay said, he was uh, on Broadway. Actually, course, he, he went, he went mm -hmm. to Southern. Okay. And then he um, went to the Air Force and he came back and um, he did a, um, a play up at Howard, um, Sophocles' Antigone, and mm -hmm. he fell in love. And, and uh, Max also was an air traffic controller. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he went through the academy uh, about two years after I did it. And, um, um, and he just, Max uh, was the person who would make a decision and he'd act upon it. He went to New York. He apparently hit the ground running. Uh, Max uh, had a lot of imagination. So being an actor was not enough for him. He wanted to direct, write. So he went to Hollywood. Uh, uh, but yeah, Max was uh, a truly a quality ball player. I, mean, was, uh, I think more people knew him in DC than they knew Elgin at the time he was at Phelps. Mm -hmm. who, who was the young guy from DC in that uh, video we just saw? He was from DC too, wasn't he? That, that young brother, Harold Dawson? I heard, uh, understand yeah. he was from DC. He was from DC. And uh -huh. he, was, uh, he was Tom Cruise's driver. He never oh. acted, acted before. Mm -hmm. uh, and Tom put him in this movie. And um, afterwards, he started taking classes. Um, but yeah, he came, you know, he's, he said, uh, he said, Jay, he said, I don't know where, where I am. You know, he said, uh, I've never been uh, an actor before, and I'm starting my first production with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise, <laughs> Jamie Moore, and the people who came in, uh, like for one day, like Cuba Gooding Jr. and uh, um, um, uh, Keeper Sutherland, and you know, uh, you know, it was Kevin Bacon. I mean, just uh, on and on. Um, mm -hmm. It was like he was sitting there like, what the hell is this? Where am I? Right, right, right. Maggie, I want to bring you in, uh, in here and because you got you guys got a lot in common. Uh, you got a question for Oh no, Dave? he's worked he's worked in real movies. I've done bit parts. I was on camera for like five seconds or three seconds. I did say a few things, but uh, I just always admired your work. And and when you said you started out as an air traffic con controller, I, I thought of uh, I have a friend Nick Johnson who also was an air traffic controller at, you know, here in for a long time. And, uh, but he never got into acting, but it, it sounds like that was a, a way for you to be aware of a lot of things, but also knowing when the part started opening up that it was your calling to go and do something else. And a lot of people labor in jobs forever and ever saying, I don't know if I should do this. What was that? final snap that said, see ya. Because you kind of explained it, but you didn't say what was the real straw that broke the camel's back. Well, I, you, you know, sports is a performing art. Very true. And, and I, I, I guess as a, a very small child, I had massive insecurities. I had sinus, I had asthma. Uh, they thought I had infantile paralysis. Wow. Um, 
I missed a lot of time in school. So when I went to school and they asked me to stand and, uh, and uh, answer questions or say something, it was impossible. I was scared to death of, and, uh, of people. And adults never helped in those days because they never talked to children. They said children were meant to be seen, not to be heard. So um, uh, I never thought that this, that acting would be something that I would do, or even social. People thought I was uh, standoffish, but I just was scared to death. You were shy. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds so, like a little bit of an introvert, too. Well, yeah, well, that's, I was probably thought of more of that than I really was. I wanted to be, I wanted to be out there. I wanted to be among people. And a, a track was the thing that brought me um, uh, into a place in myself where I was used to performing in front of people. And uh, Lucas will tell you that we were uh, uh, not only a, a really good team, but we were a bunch of clowns. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that was what I think that started, that gave me a feeling that um, maybe I could do this. Uh, um, and I never, you know, people like Richard Cole gave me great reviews in Washington. And uh, it was a friend of mine who was an air traffic controller who had gone to Dunbar, who would come to see everything I did. And one day he, we, we sat down uh, after the show and he said, you know, Jimmy, you ought to do this as a profession. And I said, no. he said, no, no. He said, I sit there in the audience and I hear what people say about you. I see what the critics say about you. And I know in your heart of hearts, you really want to do this. You ought to go on and do this. And, uh, okay, I'm going to pause the top of the screen so everybody get in. Gary, Gary Johnson. Well, I wanted to know, I mean, I've, I'm familiar with your background and a lot, but what are you currently doing? Are you still active um, as much? No, no I, I, um, I severed my ties with the industry. Two, two years ago, I did a play here in LA and was nominated for an Ovation Award. I hadn't done theater for 30 years um, before that, but you know, it doesn't go away. Um, I just, you know, the, I, I've gotten into photography now um, and there are other things I wanna do. I, 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 you know, go up and down the coast, Yosemite, um, uh, Grand Canyon, places like that. And I'm reaching a point where I'm not really secure in my mind that I could really hold down a job as an actor. Uh, I don't know whether I remember dialogue anymore. Um, I don't, you know, there, there, were, there were a lot of things. Uh, fact is, is that <clears throat> I'm 88 years old and um, it's just you look good. <laughs> yeah, you, you moisturize very well. Yes. <laughs> so you know, it's just time for you know to fold that up, and uh, I don't have to work. So you know, it's like um, there it is. I've got Christine Johnson at the top of the screen. Is that Chris? Oh. It's not Christine. It's uh, it's Jean Johnson. Christine, oh, it's Christine wife, up there. Okay, yeah, it's her computer. I'm on. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> uh, I'm an ex-air traffic controller myself. I was fired in '81, and I was just amazed that uh, I didn't know beforehand that Jim was a controller, and uh, it, his story is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. how, how old were you when you did Remo Williams? Oh, God. Remo, I must have been 50. I don't know. You, you I, I, I was 37 when I went into the business. Uh, when I left, uh, when I started in New York, I think I was 37. Wow. See, now, so, I was about 35 when we were fired in 81. And uh, I... It was I, a controller strike? Excuse me? Yes. The strike? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I, I got out then. 
but uh, were you at Washington National? I mean, uh, uh, no, I was up on the East Coast, uh, New England, most of it. Oh, New England, the Empire Towers. All right. Okay, Uh, Lawrence Lucas. You got you got to unmute yourself. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, uh, Mr. Preston. Mr. Lucas. (laughs) uh, I want you to know that I look a lot like my brother. Yeah, I know, man. You always, uh, your brother looks a lot like you. <laughs> well, well, actually, James um, has a long history with you. Uh, yes, you. You all ran track together. And I remember when I ran track at Spingarn, I went to Bridgeton Relays, and I looked in the book, and who did I see? Uh, the record holder and, and the winners of the two-mile relay was James Preston, James Lucas. Help me out here, James. Uh, Jim Courtney. Jim, Courtney. And uh, it, was, it was one of the James, wasn't it? I think it was, um, it was Jim Lucas, Jim Courtney, Jim Young. Ah, that's it. And Jim yeah. Preston. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell a little story about you. And um, I don't really don't have a question. But um, the last time we met, um, you went over to my mother's house. And I'm going to tell a secret on you. you the Chitlins. Remember, but, the but Chitlins. You remember. The Chitlins. The Chitlins. I, right. I, every time I was in town, Marion would say, OK, tell him, <laughs> tell him I'm going to do Chitlins. That's right. Okay, so that was the la- that was the last time I'd seen you, and I've been following you. And uh, I, your brother ran track with me uh, there at Spingarn as well. So uh, I want to say that um, we've been following you and and talking about you when you were not around. And but y- you have a very special place in my heart because uh, I remembered you. I remembered your history. Your brother reminded me of your history, and I've been following you uh, through my, my brother James for all, all those years. So uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Harold called me and told me that you were going to be on the show. Um, uh, when was the last time you ran 800 meters? That's <laughs> 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 okay. the last time I walked 800 meters. Yeah, right. <laughs> all right, Ken, Ken, Ken. I'm looking at Ken. Do you have a question uh, uh, for Jay? Ken? Now, Ken, he must be muted. What about you, CJ? Uh, yeah, the only question I would have is, um, what advice would you give any young entertainers? Like, I know a lot of musicians in my space, but a lot of people who are into acting and any type of trying to get into Hollywood, what advice would you give them into navigating that space as treacherous and as tricky as it can be, especially for people of color? Well, I, I think to start with, you got to want to so much that rejection bounces off you like water on a duck's back. Mm. You can turn the, the most, sound out. I've got the sound out here. That's all of it. <laughs> if, you're not serious, if you're not serious, forget it. Because it uh, okay, Ken, uh, are you off mute, Ken? Ken, are you off mute? Yeah. You know, this okay. is, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Uh, this ahead. is my first experience with uh, a Zoom meeting, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of fumbling with the controls. Okay. But I'm on here now. All right. Do you have a question for Jay? Oh, I, how you doing, Jim? I'm good, man. How you doing, Ken? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, Jim and I hung over Radar Scope uh, for a few years together in uh, uh, Washington <laughs> Air Traffic Control Center. Wow. And, uh, yes, I did. don't have a question for him, but I uh, was wondering if he remembered when he announced to, uh, to us in the, in the center that he was going to quit and break <laughs> into movies. And we all looked at him and said, Jim, you must be out of your mind. You're going to give up this $10,000 a year and, and, and take a flyer on the movies. <laughs> and he said, yeah, and he got the last laugh. Right. He sure did. How okay. are you doing, Tim? <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Jones. 
Mute. You're on mute. I'm still You're on mute. No, now we got oh, you. I'm good. Um, the, my question is, who have you watched who you think is uh, uh, the next up and comer we should be keeping our eye on? Uh, let me say this. Uh, I'm absolutely overwhelmed with the enormous number of really, really talented Black performers who've come along. I mean, every my daughter Scott uh, tells me movies that I should watch. And there are so many incredible people. I mean, there was a time when I went for an audition, every black actor in, in, uh, in town was up for the same role because there was just not that much. Um, uh, but now it's expanded because we are making our own movies. Um, and um, we, are, we have shown that there is a market for us since the ex, ex, black exploitation films. Um, it saved the black exploitation films saved Hollywood. So for me to, to name names, uh, um, I, I know I would slight some people and I don't want to do that. There's so many, so many. And I'm not talking about great black actors, I'm talking about great actors go beyond color. You don't even want to mention that. So you feel like it's, it's gotten better? Um, you know, there's always that debate about whether uh, there are enough parts for, for Black actors. You think that it's... It's, it's, gotten, as, it's okay. gotten as good as we have made it. Let's put it that way. Um, and, and we have made it uh, that expansive because of the fact that there are a lot of black people who have enough money to make movies. I mean, enormous, uh, like Oprah Winfrey has her own studio in Atlanta and she makes television movies and television series. Uh, um, uh, um, Kobe Bryant had begun uh, to produce movies. Uh, LeBron James, Shaquille uh, O'Neal. Uh, there is the money to do that now because they all know that there's never been a black movie made that didn't turn a profit. Okay, uh, Richard Jones, I see you there, Richard. Richard, take yourself off mute. Okay, I think I'm off mute. Okay, I got my mask on and also had my granddaughter with me, so it's Hi. Me. <laughs> I, I'm, glad you, I'm glad your granddaughter was there because I was going to say if you've gotten so paranoid you wear a mask even when you're by yourself <laughs> well I just want to make comment, one comment uh, about Mr. Preston telling you about his shyness okay and uh, the fact that he was afraid to stand up in front of an audience and that he was very humble well, he overcame that, I think, in the air traffic control career field. Uh, so I just have a comment to make. I will also say I've known him for 50 years, probably. Uh, and, and I will bow to any other folk that have some questions, because I, I know some things about him he probably wouldn't want me to reveal. All right. <laughs> and the feeling is mutual. <laughs> so okay. I'll, I'll pass it on, Harold. Okay, Richard. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to Michael. Michael? Michael Jackson. Hey, uh, I had a couple of uh, comments uh, and questions. Uh, first, have you had a chance to come to Salem, Alabama in your uh, lifetime and career? Salem, Alabama. Has he had a chance to walk across the bridge? Who had the chance to walk across the bridge? Have you had a chance to walk across? I guess he's talking about the Edmund Edmund Pettus. Bridge. Uh, I, uh, I, I never considered myself nonviolent, and um, yeah, <laughs> and, and, and it, you know, it, it, it was a rough, it was a rough life anyway, you know, and to volunteer your body to be whipped up on, you know, 
it just did not appeal to me. Uh, uh, I was with that in spirit. Uh, I'm asking that I'm the district attorney there, so I was just wondering. I'm they got no, a black I, attorney now, so I'm I'm it. <laughs> uh, the other uh, question I had is. If you were a young person going to Hollywood now and given the, the virus situation and other things, how would a person survive until they could make it uh, big? How, could they, how would they survive financially today? Uh, uh, well, during the pandemic, I don't know, but I know a lot of actors, uh, people who came out here who um, you know, there are temporary agencies that, that thrive on actors, um, waiters, um, uh, salesmen. Uh, I mean, there's, there's always something to do to make, to make a living. I mean, um, and you're not gonna really involve yourself any more than you have to because you wanna be available, right. you know, for auditions and all of that kind of stuff. So you learn to live cheap. I learned that in New York City. Um, and, and the thing about it is that if you're a single man and the ladies who you date who are actresses, they're in the same business. So if you are not working, they understand that and they will pick up the tab. Right. Okay, K KQC, who is that? KQC, are you there? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I, I, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be online with Mr. Preston. Uh, I was thinking about him when um, he played Gina's dad on Martin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A couple of uh, the scenes, you know, it, it really made me laugh. But then I was impressed when he played on um, A Few Good Men, when he played the judge. And uh, I was also impressed when I found out that he was from the city and uh, I believe Southeast Washington, DC. That's right. Northwest. Northwest. He's from okay, Northwest. Okay, so, so what, I, what I researched has to update that, but that, that's great. So I got a question for you. Um, do you think you'll write a book? Um, I think I wanted to, but whether I will or not is questionable. Uh, I have difficulty getting things started. <laughs> oh, I get them started and I don't finish. This is a, a time in my life that that is happening more than it's ever happened because of being retired and being elderly, you feel in your mind, I don't have to. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I, I understand being, being retired, you can do exactly what you want to do. Yeah, well, as much as you can, you know. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, that's the only thing that disturbs me about this pandemic is that uh, you're limping. I, I, you know, I bought a new car, you know, and, and uh, there's uh, no place to go. I can go out on the road somewhere, but where am I going? <laughs> you know, what am I going to do when I get there? Okay, we'll go down to Scotty. Scotty, Scotty, come on in here. I know you've been waiting. There you are. Oh, oh no, I, I, I haven't been waiting really. Oh, I mean, okay. Oh, you just want to I, listen. <laughs> I, absolutely, because this is the kind of scenario I learned things about my dad I didn't know. And okay. so, yeah, this is enriching. Thank you, everybody, for that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Jim, I want to I wanna ask you this. What do you remember about Elgin Bell? You know, Elgin just passed, he just lost, uh, of course, Hank Aaron. What, what are your fondest memories of uh, Elgin? You know, he came out right behind you, and of course, you know where he went. And uh, tell us, and, and, and of course, about, we were talking about uh, Max Julian, you know, those great athletes that came out of Armstrong and Spengon and Phelps and Dunbar. Tell us uh, how you feel about Elgin. Well, I knew Max very well. Uh, Max, Max and I uh, were both closet readers. Uh, uh, you know, people didn't, a lot, a, a lot of kids who were athletes didn't read, but Max and I read and we exchanged a lot of things. Um, Elgin was very close to Max's mother. Um, 
And I was very close to Max's mother, but Elgin went to Spingon, I went to Armstrong, and we never met at Max's mother, at Max's house. Uh, we, Max and I had a lot in common. Um, we were like the second child. Uh, Max's brother, Taswell, became a cardiologist. My sister, Agnes, uh, was a biochemist. Um, and we followed them in school and, and, and right behind them. And all the teachers always say, you mean you're so-and-so's brother? You can't, I can't believe that because they were <laughs> focused and dedicated and we were out there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, uh, um, and Max, I think, I think was probably one of the best ball players I, I had seen. I mean, he played up in uh, uh, the um, area like 18th in California, I forget what. Right, right. Calabon Road, right. And uh, um, I think Elgin played mostly in, on the playgrounds in the Northeast, uh, you know. Yeah, that's so right. So we all knew Max uh, in my neighborhood. Um, Elgin, we watched him play. We knew of him, but um, he wasn't one of ours, uh, more or less, uh, as a neighborhood. He was one of ours when he went to University of Washington because he was from D.C. And anybody from D.C. was one of ours once they left D.C. Um, he was a big guy for his time. I mean, he was truly uh, in high school, uh, uh, a giant of a guy. I mean, he was tall. Uh, and I knew tall because I ran against uh, Will Chamberlain at Penn Relays in a, in a medley relay. Mm -hmm. Boy could gobble up some ground. Uh, hi there. <laughs> Thank you. What? All of you. Hey, um, say, hey, <laughs> say, hey, while we're in that arena, it was some very influential people during your days in high school. I'm talking about the coaches, man. You know, I'm talking about Dave Brown. I'm talking about Charlie Baltimore, uh, Jesse uh, Chase and Dumbo. Tell us the influence the coaches had on you guys as young athletes. Uh, I know Stuart, uh, who was the track coach, had a great deal of influence, and Charlie Baltimore was extraordinary. I mean, he was in touch with all the colleges from not the HPC, but the Negro College, at, at those days it was called the Negro Colleges. He was in touch with all of those coaches. Uh, and together they would scout players and pull players into the Negro Colleges, many of whom would have gone to white colleges because they felt that they didn't have really anything to attract people except their athletic programs. And that's how they got you know, their students and their money. Uh, none of us went to Howard University because Howard University did not give athletic scholarships. So the best athletes in DC did not go to Howard University, none of them. Couldn't afford to. All right. All right. We uh, what I want to do now, Gary, I want you to go to the next video because this is the video that um uh folks don't want us to know about. This is one of uh, really one of the most controversial uh, movies that Jim has ever uh, been in. And I've heard people say, well, there's gonna be a remake. Let's take a look. It checks out on both computers, plus the one we have as a safety valve backstopping cross-check. If the elections were held today, you would lose by 1.846 percentile. 1.846 percentile. Oh, yes. <laughs> the computers don't lie. Isn't there a possible breakthrough with any of the peer groups? How are we doing on the Jewish vote? The senator is solid with the Jews, Mrs. Hennington. The Negroes are the trouble spot. The Negroes? I'm the best friend those people have in Washington. The computers indicate a sharp decline immediately after your law and order speech last winter. All right, all right. Now, let's 
see if we can come up with some ideas here. First, how do we retrieve the lost Negro black vote? Gil, why don't we accuse the CIA of a racially discriminatory hiring policy? They have no Negroes, except on a menial level, you know. Certain, but I mean, that may be it. I'm positive, but I'll check it out with our man over at personnel. Good. Whoever they select will be the best-known spy since 007. That was the film that, of course, one of the most controversial uh, films that Jim has done. I wanted to start at 118 because it shows him in the, the detective. Uh, it shows him in the guy uh, who was really the CIA guy that went on to become uh, one of the biggest spies ever. And he created all kinds of chaos uh, within the CIA because he was the spook that sat by the door. And that, that book and that film went on to be uh, a great piece of uh, uh, folklore in, in, in the black community. And uh, they took it off the shelf. We couldn't find the books for a long time. Uh, I've heard rumors that there was going to be a remake of the movie. Jim, where, where are we? Have you heard anything about being, having a remake of the movie, The Spook the Set by the Door? Tell us about that and that experience. Sam Greenlee is dead. Ivan Dixon is dead. Uh, Tom Newson is dead. These are the guys who uh, produced it. Uh, and uh, Lawrence Cook is dead. Um, I went to the Annapolis Film Festival, uh, uh, which was set up by my daughter for me to come and uh, do the Q and A for the Spook Set by the Door, because I was the only one left, actually. Wow. Uh, Paul Butler now is dead. Um, so I don't think there was, I mean, we didn't have the money to make that film to start with. Mm -hmm. I went out from New York to uh, Gary, Indiana, where Hatcher was mayor, had just become mayor. And he said we could do whatever we wanted to in that town. The setting was supposed to be Chicago. But he had a black mayor in Indiana who invited us to come there. Um, I shot a week. They sent me back to New York. I didn't hear from them for a month because what they were doing was taking the film stock that they had shot and saying to people, this is what we got, this is what we're doing to get money. And they got donations as low as $2. And that went on for quite a while, getting pieces to put together to make a film because they could not get backing. Well, in the final analysis, um, uh, Bill Cosby uh, bailed them out to uh, the tune of like $40,000. And we finished the movie and it opened in New York City, uh, no publicity. Um, maybe there was, when we went for the premiere, maybe there was 50 people in the theater. Hmm. And then it played for a week and disappeared. Wow. Uh, Anybody else can take the information? Anybody else got a question for, for Jim? Just raise your hand. Anybody? Okay. One of the things, Jim, what I can understand is that if we were able to uh, get the Malcolm X movie off, and that's one of the most controversial uh, individuals that we ever had in the Black America, but they were able to do that. And I can, I, I'm surprised that somebody like Spike Lee and, and these other guys that got the bank roll or know how to get the money uh, have not uh, come back and tried uh, to uh, remake this movie. Um, I don't know why they would. I mean, really, uh, because now it would be considered urban terrorism. Right, that's right. 
And mm -hmm. so it would be a negative as opposed to a positive, uh, you know, that it, and it, you know, uh, in those days when it came out, it scared a lot of people. They didn't want to scare anybody now. Right. Because they know the police would come out with tanks and stuff and blow us up. <laughs> 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 You're be... absolutely right. <laughs> Can I so, ask them, uh, yeah. what is this movie about? I had never heard of it. I think it's best you go on Google and pull up Spook oh. and uh, Set by the Door. That's That'd be the best thing for you to do right now. Okay. Because it would take too much time for us to begin to go through it and try to explain it. Anybody? You can watch the whole movie on movie. YouTube. Yes, yes you can. YouTube. I was yeah. going to say the whole thing. movie on YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And the Set by the Door. It's a better yeah. book than it is a movie. That's uh, what everybody says. Yeah, I had the book better. for a long time. Much better book than it is a movie. But can we buy the book now, or is it off the shelves completely? You can find the book uh, on Amazon. Amazon. Uh, okay. Yeah. On Amazon. You can find it on Amazon. Uh, Jim, what about COVID-19 out on the West Coast? Are you guys going to experience the same thing that we are uh, experiencing here on the East Coast as far as uh, folks of color uh, not being able to get uh, the COVID-19 uh, shot? I, I think in some areas, yes. Um, it's, it, you know, it's hard. It, 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 what's, what's the difficult thing about it is that people don't know where to go to get it. And right now in LA, any CVS pharmacy will give you a covert shot. I got mine at the, in the parking lot of uh, Dodger Stadium. Um, just went online and made an appointment and got it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, what, what, I mean, we have a problem with facilities because in most of the black neighborhood, black areas, they don't have medical facilities. They don't have hospitals. Um, and it's like any other cities. Uh, there are black people who live in an area and they won't, won't come out of it. Right. They just won't come out of it. And one of the things is because they dress different. You know, uh, the, 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 the characters in the neighborhood have a specific look, which the police recognize, and they pick them up for something or uh, whatever when they recognize them on the street. So they don't go to uh, Hollywood. They don't go to Beverly Hills. Uh, uh, they don't go to West Hollywood. Uh, they don't, you know, it's like uh, uh, you can find yourself isolated. And it isn't, you know, wh what the biggest problem is, is, uh, is the police and non-documented people from the south of the border who live in the Hispanic neighborhoods who don't come out because they know they will be picked up. So they don't get vaccinated, they don't get tested, and they're always on the verges of the black neighborhoods. Hmm. So you got that, I mean, that's a huge problem. Um, these people come out to go to the store uh, and they can be picked up by ICE. That's hmm. anybody, back. Huh? anybody else got anything they want to add on to that? Go ahead, Lawrence. Go ahead. Mute. Huh? Um, James, um, two, two things. Um, I always wondered why my brother James uh, did not follow you to North Carolina. And the other thing, what athletes did you run with and against that you found to be outstanding because of the coaching that you got in high school and went on to college. Uh, do you feel as though that career and that competition was part of the reasons why, and that's the third question, the reason why you were so successful in movies? Well, um... 
first, let me say this. There was no expectation of anybody who ran track to have a future in track beyond college. You know, the, you know they make money today running track. <laughs> I mean, get, they get endorsements today running track. Uh, uh, they have all kinds of meets that track athletes get paid enormous money for. That's in those true. days, there was no future. There was very little future in football at that particular time or basketball for all practical purposes. I mean, Elgin was like the beginning of uh, the black athletes uh, beginning to dominate bas basketball. Um, so if you ran track, it was, you know, uh, to get to college on a, a scholarship or because you just, you know, loved doing that. Um, there were a lot of people here who, um, who uh, ran, in DC who ran, like Maury Wills, who uh, did not, uh, who baseball became his thing, but he was uh, a track athlete also. Uh, um, James Bruce at Howard was probably one of the best um, uh, half milers in uh, in the country. Um, uh, Lewis Johnson, who became a choreographer, who choreographed Damn Yankees, and he and Cheetah Rivera danced together in in uh, high school and then they went to Juilliard and Cheetah Rivera became, I mean, uh, Dolores Figaro became Cheetah Rivera, Louis Johnson choreographed Damn Yankees and became a big star as a choreographer. Wow. So there were a lot of track people who did other things, Francis Henderson, a uh, football player. Uh, so we, you know, everybody could run, but some were better than others and, uh, uh, I guess uh, running was a, uh, a a black talent for whatever reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, okay, okay. Hey Jim, you know when, when I got down to Winston Salem, I went down a football basketball scholarship. But when I got to Winston Salem, that wasn't the main sport. Track with Elias Gilbert and those guys at Winston Salem, they dominated yeah. track back then in those days. And yeah. I know you are aware of that that great talent that that was around the circuit at the time, but uh, we got to Winston Salem and track guys were the stars. Well, you know, it, it track was probably the most uh, inexpensive uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. sport that were among the, you know, football, basketball, uh, baseball. That's right. You know, track was the the less least expensive for school. Also, the fact is, is that during our time, as a track person, you could compete against anybody, but in the other sports, if they were considered contact sports, you did not compete against white teams. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So as track people, we, we competed against them all. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that was probably one of the reasons why track was so popular in the South, because they definitely didn't play contact. Uh, black and whites deal in contact sports. Anybody else? We're getting down to the nitty gritty. We've got about uh, eight minutes or so left. Anybody else got any questions for Jim? Okay, well, let me move on. Hey, Jim, one of the things that uh, uh, I, about... I have a question, real quick. Okay, go um, ahead. Yeah, so. Um, you were telling me a story, Dad, about this your your school Armstrong going to the college meet of when all the colleges came together in DC and it was so funny the way you set it up do you remember telling me that story and can you share that with everybody I think they'll appreciate it uh, so, uh, Armstrong was invited to an AAU meet at uh, American University and we got there and it was all colleges there were no high schools there except us um and um there we were uh unusually uh, uh tall uh, for our particular time uh, everybody on our mile relay team and um and um two mile team were six feet at least or over 
I think uh, uh, Lawrence's brother was probably one of the short ones of us. I think Jim was close to six feet. But uh, there were these, this black track group that came out on to the uh, track field in bright orange on a uh, spring afternoon. And they said, these are high school kids. And we made an impression um, uh, because it, it was like the only team that was really better than us was Georgetown. So we were a high school team. Nobody else came. No other high school showed. And we, we competed against uh, colleges. One of the things I want to talk about before we get out of here, I think everybody's aware of this. Um, looking out in Minnesota and we're looking at the, this uh, cop on trial, it looks like uh, the, the guy that got murdered is on trial. I'm trying to figure out who's on trial here as we look at what's going on around this country and what's happening in Minnesota. Does anyone have a take on that? I've got a take on it. One of the things that hit me as I watched this trial was the humanity and what the witnesses, I mean, it. Every so, the witnesses that said, for example, I wish I hadn't taken that bill, or I wish I could have done something more. Um, but just that, you know, George Floyd was a human, and even his girlfriend. They painted it was just the humanity, and the inhumane treatment of these police officers, particularly the ones. She, who had his knee on his neck for nine minutes. Well, that's, we had a, a, a situation like that here in California, uh, Rodney King, who got beaten by six policemen uh, with clubs continuously. And when he went to trial, what the uh, defense lawyers tried to do was to paint Rodney King as some savage brute who uh, his dominance and his ferocity was of such a nature that the only way these police could contain him was in that fashion. And, and they're trying to do the same thing with George Floyd, uh, trying to make, you know, he was on uh, opiates and uh, uh, he's this big man and, he, you know, uh, uh, they're trying to dehumanize him and uh, put him on trial, really. That's what the defense is trying to do. But I think they're not succeeding in doing that in this particular case. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the defense. I'm actually baffled that their defense is he did what he was trained to do, which is not a reassuring defense if well, that's, that's what he was trained to do. That, that, that's, not, uh, that's not their policy. No, so, even the uh, his supervisors and superiors were on stand just Friday saying no, yep. that he went too far. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what I was most surprised about was the fact that it was, he was on his neck for over nine minutes. Nine minutes. You know, we heard the eight minutes and 46 seconds, okay? So that's all we heard was eight minutes and something. Well, and to find right. out it was really over nine, yeah. I think that was what I was most astounded at more than anything, but also to see all of the people who, how Chauvin in a sense lied and his, uh, his superior, his sergeant, didn't know the real truth until after they were back at the police station. You know, it's just, uh, you, you're starting to see a pattern and I've already, I know they've already said they will not do any information about the other six incidents that Chauvin was in that he had complaints against. But I see a lot of his associates, superiors and things like that saying, nope, we're gonna distance ourselves from him. He's a bad cop, but why did it take so long? Mm -hmm. Was the additional mm -hmm. evidence when they saw yeah. the other, the cameras from the other angles, from the, the camera that was across the street and that right. one image of multiple mm -hmm. cops kneeling on him to restrain him simultaneously. So it, it became obvious that it wasn't just one bad apple as they like to say, 
this is a practice of the department, they all had to begin to shift. And, and that probably makes this case a little different um, from the others. It's very typical of the defense to try to assassinate the character of the victim. Yeah, um, that's what defense is all about. It, it's, yeah. it's very uh, uh, common to try to compartmentalize or um, frame them. So when the Rodney King beating, for example, they went frame by frame and showing the video so that every time he put his hand up to defend himself, it was then characterized as he was fighting back. And that's why they had to go in on him because he was coming at them. And so that's not working as a strategy in this instance. And the fact that the supervisors are saying that it was not um, a, a procedure, that it wasn't a, the appropriate behavior that wasn't part of the, the, the training, or they tried to deny that it was part of the training, that's different because you almost never see a cop testify against a cop. Well, I think what's happening now is the police are throwing him under the bus because they don't. <laughs> yeah. They don't want the department to be uh, uh, characterized that way. Um, in the five seasons I did Hill Street Blues, we had uh, police advisors. They made a lot of money on the show, actually. But, uh, you know, my observance with L.A., which I see in most major cities, which was different than when I was growing up in D.C., was that there is no contact between the police and, and the public or the community. And when I was growing up in D.C., the police had to walk. They walked the beat. So they were in your neighborhood on their feet uh, without the protection of a car or, or backup or whatever. And in the wintertime, policemen were sometimes invited in for a cup of coffee and to get warm in people's houses. They knew the community and they knew who was um, a troublemaker and who was not, and they would bring you home to your parents. Now, I know that wasn't true all over DC, but in some neighborhoods it was because they did know the people in the community. They were human beings because they came in contact with them foot to foot, face to face. Now you got policemen only in cars. Well, Jim, one of the reasons why the, the, cops, the cops were walking back then is that they wouldn't allow black cops to ride in the car. So that's why uh, there was really police community uh, community policing before you know it really was because I, I know guys may never were allowed to ride in police cars. I want to take this opportunity to take the last uh, three minutes to show y'all the three minutes we were trying to show earlier. We'll give you some idea about what spook that set by the door was all about. Jim is playing a cop. <laughs> he's playing a cop and he's meeting with this guy uh, who went on to become the big, uh, the spook that sat behind his, behind the door for the CIA. Uh, could we run that, Gary? Thank you. Do. The streets have to be safe. Safe for who? You're here to protect property, not lives. Well, that's what it's all about, isn't it? You worked hard to get what you got, didn't you? And you want to keep it just like I do? Bullshit. Listen, you think because you got a badge and I got a couple of degrees, that makes a difference? Do you know what white folks call people like you and me in private? Niggas, dogs. Niggas. Hey, hey, hey. Emergency vets and swoon knowledge. Well, I'm sorry, man. Maybe the last three nights been a little bit much. I got a board meeting. I got to go reassure the white folks. Let's go get some meat, okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, that was a that was a real tense scene there, Jim. That was that's why I wanted to show it the the tense uh, underlining thing that was going on between you and, and my man uh, Spook that sat by the door. Al Cook, yeah. Al Al and I were friends from uh, New York. He he was a collector before he um, became an actor. Uh, you know what a collector is in New York? No. 
<laughs> he's a guy who, when people don't pay the. Uh... <laughs> okay. He, okay. He, he collects. Uh, he okay. Was, uh, he was airborne uh, during the Korean War. Um, and uh, Al and I made, made friends. Uh, we were in, in Gary, Indiana, and uh, I climbed up the back of his, uh, his, his motel room was in the back by the railroad track. And I climbed up the wall and went over his balcony and went through the door. And when I got in, in the, in, in, uh, into the room, he's standing there pointing a 45 at me saying, how you doing, Jimmy? <laughs> 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 that was the kind of guy Al was. Uh, uh, you know, he, he was a, a very bright guy, you know, and a, a lot of fun to, to work with, had a great sense of humor. Um, absolutely. Well, look, man, we've run out of time. I want to thank you, uh, Jay, for taking time out to be with here, us here on Speak the Truth. I think we all of us learned something uh, from this show uh, from many different angles, not only uh, from the sports angle, but also from the human interest uh, politics part, man. And uh, I think, uh, man, you have been a, a, a great asset, uh, a great person o over the years, man. And uh, like I said, I'm, I, thank, I thank my man Richard uh, Jones for introducing me to you because uh, we've been friends ever since. And uh, I'm proud of you, man. And, Keep on doing. You relax it down. You enjoy, of course, being retired. So I understand that. So I know you'll be back to D.C. soon as thing this pandemic way off, man. So Absolutely. keep on doing the great thing that you're doing. And you got the last word, Jim. Take care of that pretty girl right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the last okay. word. That's the last word. Okay. Uh, I just want to go out here by saying, as I always say, hey, you cannot soar with eagles if you're hanging out with chickens. And we don't hang out with chickens. <laughs> Y'all have a great one. Bye -bye. Hey All right. Ladies. All right, Scotty. If like you take a time to be here too. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Scotty. All right. Hey, Good Richard. You. Bye, all. Good seeing you, Dan. Great. You too. Looking forward to talking to you, James. Ken Fountain. Hey, Thanks hey, for coming yeah. on, Ken. Be Ooh, safe, wear please. your mask. All Be right. Man. Hi, I'm Harold Bell. My wife Hattie and I found the nonprofit organization in 1968, shortly after the riots that almost destroyed my hometown, Washington, D.C. The program caters to the needs of at-risk children as it relates to social services such as education, law enforcement, drug abuse, gang-related violence, and other antisocial behavior. 